The Biophilic Cities Project started at UVA in 2011 to explore and advance nature in cities. In the fall of 2013, the Global Biophilic Cities Network was launched, with partner cities spanning the globe from Phoenix, Arizona, Singapore, and Wellington, New Zealand. The webinar series is one of the many ways in which the new Global Biophilic Cities Network will help to disseminate knowledge about the innovative work of cities, organizations, and projects. The series will consist of eight presentations once a week until mid-November. To see the full schedule of topics and to register for one or more of these upcoming webinars, please visit our website at www dot biophiliccities dot org slash webinar dash series. Next week we will be hearing from Spanish landscape designer Mark Granian, director of Phytokinetic Gardens in Notion, a project that fits public buses with their own green roofs. He will talk about how truly green buses can provide a new ecological value for cities while connecting citizens with nature in an unprecedented way. Today we will be hearing from Jane Martin, who holds, who heads both Shift Design Studio and Plant SF. Through Shift Design Studio, Martin's work encompasses commercial, residential, and civic architectural landscape and art projects. Due to her work in the Bay Area, Jane Martin was named one of the region's leading experimental designers by the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. In addition to her work with Shift Design Studio, Martin is the founding director of Plant SF, a nonprofit whose projects focus on stormwater diversion through community-based planting projects using permeable landscaping. Ms. Martin earned a BS of Architectural Studies from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and her Master of Architecture from Cranbrook Academy of Art. Jane Martin will speak for 30 minutes to be followed by questions from the audience. So I will go ahead and turn it over to Jane. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon. We're, good evening, wherever you are. Um, I'm uh, joining you from San Francisco, and I will be talking about a project that I've been doing out here for a little over 10 years now. And um, just to confirm um, that everybody can hear me, uh, Amanda, are we good? Yep, you sound great. OK, thank you. Um, so um, I've got a few slides to show you here. Um, let me just make sure I can get to them here. Here we go. Um, so I wanted to talk about abundance during drought in particular because uh, California has been experiencing, as well as um, quite a bit of the western United States and other parts of the world are experiencing um, severe and persistent drought. And it's something that increasingly we um, uh, imagine that we'll be seeing more of. So um, in the new reality of adaptation, um, we want to be mindful about um, how to uh, frame our landscapes in a way that we are setting them up not just to be um, oh, uh, getting by, but really thriving. Um, and one thing that I've seen in projects here is that abundance is possible, um, and for us in California especially, um, that's possible even during drought. So um, a little bit of my background, um, as Amanda mentioned, um, I am founding director of Plant SF. It's a nonprofit that really seeks to help people understand that the urban landscape, specifically in San Francisco, can be different than fully paved which is our um, city's sort of default um, situation. So um, I came through this, uh, to this through being an architect. Um, I designed buildings is, is my background. Um, but I've been a lifelong gardener. And um, after a while, people saw my garden and asked me if, if I could design some for them. So I took the opportunity. And that seemed to go well. And I've been doing it now for about 10 years as part of my, my practice. Um, and I am a former commissioner of the Commission on the Environment here in San Francisco, specifically the Policy Commission. And through that work, um, uh, the very good work of that department, um, you can see a number of other endeavors that are related to what you'll see today. So um, I don't know how many of you may have had the opportunity to visit San Francisco. You certainly see images of it, um, popular culture. And um, the pictures on the slide that I'm showing now are really, you know, 
postcard pictures of San Francisco, which um, I have to say, as a 20-year resident of this town, um, it's pretty accurate. Um, we're, we're very fortunate um, to have a wonderful geographically placed um, place to live um, and wonderful for all of its cultural aspects as well. Um, however, there's a side of San Francisco that we don't publicize. Um, and a lot of us here try to turn the other way and, and not really acknowledge that we do uh, live in a, a, a challenged physical environment with our day-to-day -day, um, as well. And so there's a considerable amount of illegal dumping, sidewalk parking, and as I referenced before, just a sort of wall-to-wall -wall concrete as the default. Um, there's some historic reasons for that, but um, there's sort of no excuse for it um, in terms of what we have uh, available to us today. So just to put these um, physical um, attributes into context, um, firstly here, um, we have a combined sewer system. And I won't go into that, um, assuming that a number of you are likely familiar with that concept. But basically, it, it combines the building wastewater with stormwater um, directly in the middle of the street um, throughout the city. Um, as you can see in this slide, um, the wall-to-wall -wall pavement um, you know, creates this, this situation to where stormwater, when, when it rains, falls obviously very directly into the system. And it's terrific when it works well, because it means that all of the surface contaminants go to the wastewater treatment plant before getting ejected into our waterways, which here are the Pacific Ocean or Bay. Um, however, when that um, system is overloaded, um, because we have altered our natural hydrology so much by paving, um, this slide just points out that more of our public space is paved than it is parks. Um, we have a real imbalance um, and uh, some opportunity within that as well. Um, we've also, as most uh, developed areas have, um, we've hard piped our water system, so the hydrology has, the natural hydrology has been suppressed. Doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, but it, it's latent um, at best and suppressed in most uh, of the developed places in our town. Um, and so, when the volume exceeds the capacity of a combined sewer system, um, the, the result is that it overflows the system. So it either overflows, as I said, into the ocean or the bay. Um, or, in, or in our case, and um, it backs up into city streets, sidewalks, and into residences and businesses um, in a very unhappy situation, which also re results in um, some serious health ha hazards and beach closures. So even though you know, the, the picture postcard on the, the left-hand side of the slide is accurate, um, what it doesn't indicate is um, what's actually happening in the water, which um, can be quite um, this happens a number of times a year. I think our average now is about 10 to 15 um, days. That's not number of outflows, as I understand it. Um, don't quote me on that, but I think that's where we're at um, currently, which is so much better than where we were 30 years ago, of course, if, if you're aware of the history of this. But um, it's still, uh, we've got a ways to go. Um, and the second part of our context is that we bring in, because we have uh, paved over so much of our surface, we can't, can no longer rely on our local aquifer. Um, this hand, happened in tandem historically with the development of our Hetch Hetchy Reservoir um, up in the Yosemite area. It's 160 miles away, and even a little bit more importantly, it's across a number of active fault lines. So we do have vulnerability there. Um, it's fantastic water when you get it. Um, but we're also questioning here, why are we using water um, this pure for so many of our um, water needs that, that are higher that quality, you know, for instance, to flushing toilets and uh, irrigating landscape. Um, so context number three, food security. Um, just as a kind of a side point, um, planting in public spaces can also yield um, uh, arable soil, obviously, that, that can be um, used for growing crops. We love to think about our, our um, little ecosystem here as being such a, a tight um, 
circle, but in, you know, for those of you who are on the East Coast, you, know, you certainly get our food products and we're happy to send them to you. Um, but at the same time, when we think that we're shopping locally in farmers markets, um, those farmers are coming from up to 400 miles away and still qualify as being local to us. Um, so I really just want to highlight that uh, we can, while still supporting our, our agricultural industry in the state, um, we can um, provide some more localized options. And again, you know, during um, drought, this is going to be an interestingly and also in emergency in terms of earthquake um, preparedness. So the opportunities in San Francisco um, that I saw was that we have very wide concrete sidewalks, um, upwards of 14 feet wide. Um, I worked on one the other day that was 22 feet wide, um, inordinately wide. And I, I've yet to really find a, a conclusive um, answer about why uh, this historically has, has been the case. You know, it was the big expanse of West at the time um, San Francisco was being settled. And uh, we um, just have, have not treated our, our in-town landscape as um, a sort of higher priority than uh, just paving it over and using that as our default. Um, so but the opportunity in that is that we can depave what is excess, keep rain out of the sewer, replenish our aquifer, and provide an opportunity for plants. Um, just a quick example, um, this is a building in the Mission District. This happens to be the building that I have my office in. Um, when I came to the property, it looked like this. And this is actually not even the whole story. Um, in front of that stairs where the former owner used to park their car and, um, and, and you know, cross the sidewalk with the vehicle and then park the vehicle on the sidewalk. So um, quickly, you know, only a year later, um, a very different situation was possible. Um, but I want to emphasize that this is a great step, but if we're really talking about um, sustainability and abundance, um, it's the five year to 10 year um, uh, horizon that we want to be designing for. So what you don't see here is that these are, um, there's a fruiting lemon tree, there's a fruiting what we call strawberry tree, it's um, Arbutus marina. On the right there you see a little bit of of fruit up there in the right hand corner. Um, those are edible, they are local, um, and the birds love them. Um, there's a lot of uh, bird and insect activity uh, in this garden in particular. Um, so before where it was blighted, we had, as I mentioned, sidewalk parking, illegal dumping, so the couches in the earlier slide. Um, it was less safe, certainly less pleasant, less attractive and really void of life. And just to go back to this slide where you see the um, young children there, it really has made a difference, especially for young people. I'm talking like toddlers who are, you know, all of this activity now, all of the butterflies and bees and the right at their eye level. And it's also really made a difference um, with our local seniors who find it difficult to get to the neighborhood parks. So this is sort of a parks along the way strategy. Um, so the after version is uh, much more vibrant. Uh, they're what I would really call appropriate uses of the sidewalk space. Um, it's definitely cared for. It's safer because people are spending more time and doing this extensively throughout the, the same neighborhood and throughout um, almost every neighborhood in town uh, now has some of this represented. Um, and it's so it's safer when people are out and um, having an excuse to talk to each other because they see which flower is flowering now or they're sharing cuttings out of the garden. Um, it's more pleasant, more attractive, and definitely full of life, um, whereas there was not an opportunity previously for um, uh, flora and fauna to, to really thrive. But in terms of abundance, um, there's an indelible sociability now. You know, again, this is the, the five to ten year horizon. Um, it's designed for, for infiltration, so this is 100% infiltrating now to where, um, as compared to 0% um, in the, pre the previous condition, the before picture. There's a, quite a variety of insects and birds that do use this particular garden, and we see that throughout town. Um, obviously, some opportunity for habitat and forage, color and fragrance, which um, doesn't show up here, but it's, it's extremely, um, the possibilities for fragrance, um, positive fragrance are, are quite high. And um, self-propagation, um, the only thing I find that, that I need to do in this garden is remove plants, um, and, and also to just to note it, um, this is a no-water garden, 
So all of the plants you see here um, require no irrigation. Um, the lemon tree was established after the first year. The rest of the plants, uh, they're like a three-month established period. So um, just to note that. Um, the previous project that I did, and again, um, just showing you a few additional benefits, um, there was sidewalk parking, not only parking, but driving. So um, graffiti against buildings, sometimes um, the plantings can also be helpful with um, increasing shading and cooling. Um, not so important for us here. We have a pretty temperate climate, but for um, other areas that can be a really big opportunity for um, a very localized um, adjustment of climates, uh, microclimates. So that last slide um, turned into a larger project where our neighbors came over and said, how did you get to do that? And uh, I explained that it was, at the time, a very difficult process. There was no um, permit available from the city um, to use for that. So I worked with the city, um, this is when Plant SF was established, worked with the city to create a permit process that would allow residents to do this, um, residents and business owners and schools, anyone, any property in San Francisco um, can now take advantage of this program. And opt-in program currently, it's uh, not required, um, but uh, we're hoping that it will become an expectation instead of just an exception. Um, but again, after five years of planting, you really see the benefits. Um, for those of you who are into policy and um, would like to know more about the permitting process that we put together, I'm happy to answer questions about that at the end of the session or offline. Um, but this is a, basically a one-page form with a couple of pages of instructions. And um, five, uh, 1,500 since 2006, um, I think it's probably, the accurate number is probably closer to 2,000. So we're doing well. Um, and every little bit helps. Um, and for those of you who um, maybe don't work with landscape but um, would like to incorporate some of that into other projects such as transportation or building projects, um, these are some of the areas, uh, safety, livability, transportation, water management, biodiversity, food security, temperature, air quality, and a culture of abundance um, that this can really play well into, uh, that this sort of project can work with. So again, just an example of turning um, a rather bleak uh, environment with our, um, a, a bulb out that was put in uh, by the planning department in the 1970s, early 70s, that was a good step toward trying to um, do street calming. But as I said, this can work, the, the planting in particular can work well with those sorts of transportation interventions um, because they further slow down traffic um, by giving people some drivers something to look at, something to focus on instead of just blowing past it. So you find that you um, can in, uh, decrease the speeds and also, um, again, get people out on the street, give them a place to um, meet each other. Um, speaking of giving people a place to meet each other, these projects have um, really been from the ground up very um, interactive um, in no small part because they tend to be volunteer planted. Uh, we found that as a way to be really um, cost effective. So uh, getting neighbors together, um, community groups, school groups, and teaching people how to plant, getting them um, more connected, city dwellers in particular, more connected to the ground that is really uh, only two inches from where they stand. Um, but most of the time, you know, until you take the concrete out, um, it's without realizing it. So just a little bit about plant selection because I, I do acknowledge that um, people are on the, on the webinar today from all different parts of the country and, and different planets. Um, so I won't speak to specific species, but just to say that I suggest a first look at what is native and endemic to your area and uh, promote those because native fauna really relies on them. And so these can be anything from little bugs to birds um, and other predators, um, you know, on up the food chain. So um, it really is connected, and the more that we can reestablish that instead of taking a, it away, uh, the better. Um, in, apart from that, you know, obviously edibles, where appropriate, I don't always put them on the sidewalk. Um, generally, I don't plant edibles where there's no soil or control over the soil. So, you know, you don't want someone um, 
picking fruits that have um, been exposed to toxins um, inadvertently, you know, either through um, you know, automatic uh, runoff or what have you, um, things of that nature. But I also really emphasize lovables. Um, you know, here in San Francisco, we're very close to the redwoods, and uh, we've planted a few redwoods in town. I don't necessarily recommend that for every site, but um, you know, plants that people can really um, have attachments to. Um, you know, it's it's a way to um, encourage stewardship. So, just a couple of uh, images um, to share with you of some. Um, successful projects where we've had different materials. You can see some permeable pavers in this one. And uh, I'll just go back to this one and point out that's decomposed granite on the right and left of the walking path there. It is a permeable material. It's not as permeable as, um, say, a rock mulch that lets the water flow through um, more freely. But it is a surface, and we found um, very appropriate in some applications here. Um, permeable pavers of different sorts. The one, just as a caveat, the one in the very front here with the sort of lattice um, is not one that I recommend uh, for areas that are going to be driven over, for instance. Um, they do tend to crack and break, but we have had success um, planting in them. And again, all that I'm showing you today are non-irrigated gardens. There's no um, plastic around here. I don't use filter fabric. Um, just all that's in these projects are dirt and plants and rocks. Um, some mulch bark uh, where appropriate, but I tend to use rock mulch because it's, uh, it's heavier, it, it doesn't become windblown, and it doesn't biodegrade. Now, for those of you who are in areas that um, your, your plant palette is seeking uh, more nutrients um, than you know, a, a biodegradable bark, other sort of mulch is going to be appropriate. Here, our plants are um, less um, needing less nutrients, needing fewer nutrients in terms of um, their longevity and thriving. So um, when we feed the plants here, we just get more weeds. So that's why I make that choice, just to explain it. Um, also just to note that, again, these, can, these interventions can be small or larger. Um, this is a block-long project um, just south of Market Street here in San Francisco um, that should be taking place in the next couple of years um, should be getting in the ground and building the buildings adjacent to it first. Um, and even where you have a really small footprint, um, this is a planter design where the plant is actually planted in the ground. It's a vine that will grow up through this um, bicycle planter, uh, sorry, bicycle um, rock on these legs. Um, and the canopy above is this armature. So with a very small footprint, you know, smaller than one foot square, um, you can get a canopy that is um, closer to pedestrian head height than the mature trees that we have on the street. Again, this is a project for Market Street that should be um, being seen in the next few years. A couple of other projects. Um, this is one I did with the planning department here. And while this is not uh, largely not an in-ground project, um, it is uh, recognized by some, some engineers in town as having a significant uh, water diversion effect. So um, this is in an excess roadway area. We converted 9,000 square feet, and we're able to get a significant portion of that uh, rainwater to divert into um, basically filter through and be held by these containers. So um, just a point um, that will probably be appropriate um, to some of you in other areas as well. So part of the point of um, diverting rainwater is not only to get it into the ground to, for natural filtration and, and um, availability to the local aquifer, but it's also to slow down the rate. Um, the word is desynchronization, if you want to know about that. But um, it's basically to flow, slow the flow rate from the rain um, falling from the sky to the entry into the sewer, um, where we have a combined sewer, just to um, give that capacity a break. Um, and even out the flow. Um, and this, this project does both of those strategies. Um, in addition, uh, this was a community planting project. Um, it certainly did draw out the neighbors um, and the uh, burl um, scrabblers, um, scramblers, um, people who wanted to climb the little burl at the end there, and we certainly encourage that. Um, uh, unstructured play is something that um, this 
you wanted to talk to as well. And um, always keeping in mind that there will be people who want to come and enjoy the project in um, slower ways. Uh, I always do provide um, species um, plant lists and information about the um, especially native plants on the top right of the slide. Um, and those are available also on plantsf.org if you do want to see some of the plant palettes. Um, this particular project was done in color scheme, so the, the blocks there you see are, are of different colors. Um, so people can you know, take that information and um, use it for their own gardens or see which butterflies are visiting which plants. Um, here's another project in San Francisco done for the planning department. This one is at Naples and Geneva in the Excelsior district in town in the southern part of our, our city. And it was converting 8,000 square feet in the middle of a very wide roadway um, that um, had been previously used for auto circulation um, a bit unnecessarily. And um, the planning department um, sought to convert this. Here's the decomposed granite. Um, shows you uh, an example of, again, that permanent bowl, um, material. And uh, another project in town on Valencia Street, 937 Valencia, if you're in town to visit, um, is a parklet. This is a project through the planning department that you may have heard of. Um, it's being seen around the country, around the world. Um, and this is a, a project that I did to convert a driveway, which you see on the right-hand side. You see that sort of hexagonal um, uh, pattern toward the bottom of the slide. That is uh, what used to be their driveway. Um, in this project, um, the driveway is used only for bicycles. So it could be adapted um, to have done a design that adapts this for to maintain auto access to a garage. But in this case, it was not part of the project. And again, these are all non-irrigated except for what are in planters. And I just want to make a note that it's not possible, even with drought resistant, drought tolerant, climate adapted plants, um, if desert plants, if you will. It, all plants need some sort of moisture in the soil. Um, I suppose you could argue epiphytic plants, but uh, it's a different, that's a different conversation. Happy to have with you offline. Uh, but for what we're able to do here, my strategy was to, to use as deep a planter as possible and as large as possible. That way, the water we put into it will stay uh, as long as possible and uh, give the plants the best growing environment uh, with soil depth as well. And uh, I think this is maybe one of my last examples here uh, is even in a very small project, this was a storefront project for a tea retail. A tea retailer, um, where even in a very small project, for those of us who are thinking about livability in cities, it's important that we provide even small spots for people to interact with the, the natural environment. And in this case, it was um, a Japanese grass and, and a butylon. Um, species called tiger eye, a variety called tiger eye, if you want to look that one up, it's spectacular. I think these are grown in uh, the Virginia area, for those of you who are in, uh, around there, Virginia, North Carolina. Um, spectacular flower, and this, this passerby, totally unscripted, uh, can attest that um, it really just uh, brings a moment of sociability. He was so moved that he just he brought into the conversation this group of women who happened to be walking by and uh, without even speaking the same language, they, they um, were able to communicate about the sort of spectacular nature of that particular plant. Um, so that's really all I have to share with you very briefly. I really appreciate um, the opportunity to present this work to people outside the area. And, um, and if I can be of assistance in any way in, in helping brainstorm about how to apply some of these strategies in other places, um, please feel free to contact me offline. I am Jane at plantsf.org. Um, you can also find me uh, through shiftdesignstudio.com. And I'll turn it back over to you now, Amanda, um, to moderate any questions. Thank you, Jane. That was a really great talk. I loved all of your photos. I mean, they are green, but what I really love is they have so much activity. There's people just enjoying themselves out there. Uh, so we do have some questions. Let's see. 
Have you done any projects in climates that have freezing or snowy winters? And what do you plan for that, or do you have any recommendations? Well, I haven't done any very recently. I have done uh, a little bit of work in Colorado um, and colder climates in California. Um, but I myself was raised in the Midwest, and we had a um, very present winter season. Um, the strategy that I would suggest is um, to work with what you've got. So some of that can be texture, you know, if you're still talking about vegetation and plant material. Um, definitely design for the dormant period in terms of uh, tree structure or um, how plants look during their dormant period. And also um, to use, if you're fortunate enough to get snow, um, to use that as an element or ice as an element. Um, both of those uh, materials can be um, sculpted passively, I'll say. Um, you can have a, a, a wide variety of, of um, natural qualities with, with ice and snow. So um, if you've got any projects, any cold weather projects uh, or project sites, let me know because I'd love to work on something like that. Sounds fun. Great. Um, also, do you use any plants that can bioremediate urban and vehicular pollution? And if so, which ones are the most effective for that work? I'm sorry, we are having audio problems. Can we start back from the beginning of that question? See if your audio Okay, there we I go. Am. Okay. So uh, repeat the question, please. Do you use any plants that can bioremediate urban and vehicular pollution? And if so, which ones are most effective? Right, so I am not a specialist in the bioremediation area, but I do know that some of the trees and grasses that are used in projects, um, that I use in projects, um, do have some of those properties and qualities. So um, one of the other things I was going to mention is sequestration, which is related. Um, and again, some of the grass species are, are appropriate for that. Um, and related, um, in San Francisco area, um, it's, you know, the question was brought up about winter, and um, it reminds me that the evergreen trees here are our first choice for um, not only the um, year-round, since we do have access to, to year-round blooming and foliage um, in, this, in this climate, um, it's more appropriate to use evergreen trees to have a year-round benefit for that. Sorry for stumbling over the words, but basically, you know, we, we have the opportunity to, um, to do that year-round. So um, with deciduous it's sort of insult to injury during our fall period because we are just starting to get rain here now that we're in October. We have a rainy season from basically Halloween to Easter is a shorthand version of, you know, the way to think about that. And so um, in the fall for deciduous trees that are going dormant, they're shedding their leaves, they're dropping their leaves into our, our um, catch basins and mucking the whole system up right at the point where we really need the water to be slowing down. So for that reason, I, I point people to ever in uh, a year-round foliage situation, um, and especially where you've got a uh, wet winter, dry summer. Can you talk a little bit about the permitting process and how difficult it was? Did you have to work with several city departments, or did they streamline it for you? That's an excellent question. Um, it's a very long story that I will um, tell in a shortened way. Um, it was difficult in that it uh, was tied up for me personally with sewer backups that, that occurred in my home and office. So it was a very difficult situation. Um, that said, because it was so bad, um, it got the attention of the local sewer agency and the mayor's office. And uh, the mayor at the time was Mayor Newsom, who's now our lieutenant governor. Um, he directed the Public Utilities Commission and the Department of Public Works 
to work with me, um, having established Plant SF to work with me to create that um, permit process. And the thing that surprised me the most is that I didn't have to convince anyone. You know, the, the project really sold itself. So I think if you have to sell the project, um, you know, that adds another layer. But um, people here really got it. And um, the, the city agencies were fantastic. Um, they were very well informed um, and also had kind of been waiting for some of this to, you know, to have a reason to, to pursue some of this, frankly. And the Public Utilities Commission has gone much further with this and has a whole, uh, over the past five to eight years, has created a whole um, really good set of resources that I at sfwater.org for um, many different types of stormwater diversion and low impact design as it relates specifically to urban environments. So I would definitely point you to sfwater.org for some of those tools. Great. Well, thank you, Jane, for speaking with us. It was great to see how your work has helped transform the urban landscape in the Bay Area. I mean, just seeing the before and after of your office was an amazing 180 transformation. Um, and thank you to all of our attendees for listening in. Please join us Wednesday, October 29th at 1230 Eastern Daylight Time to hear from our next speaker, Mark Granion, who will be talking about his work fitting city buses with green roofs. So thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, everybody.